Hi, everybody. Welcome to The Sit Down. I'm DJ Sixsmith. It is Dr. Lindsay Fitzharris. She's here with us. The Curious Life and Death coming to the Smithsonian Channel this weekend. Dr. Lindsay, how are you? Yeah, thanks for having me on. I hope that your audience is ready for a little bit of a grisly chat here. Well, first of all, I think you have one of the best Zoom setups I've seen of anybody <laughs> and it's kind of fitting to everything that you study and you talk about. So what was it like putting this whole series together? Uh, it was amazing. Yeah, I mean, one of the things here is this ballistic gel body. This is created by a guy named Chris Mills out in Los Angeles, and we use these in the show. Um, and so the show is a bit of everything. It's forensic science. It's true crime. It's a bit of history, which I love because I'm a historian. And we look at the curious deaths of people in the past. So one of the episodes that we're doing this Sunday is reopening the case against Lizzie Borden, who allegedly took an axe in 1892 and killed her father and stepmother. Do you remember that child's rhyme? No, hit me with it. Let's hear it. Oh my God. Yeah. I think actually it's taught to, uh, to little girls more, um, but it's Lizzie Borden took an ax, gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41. But in reality, <laughs> it wasn't 81 wax. It was something like 29, enough to kill two people. Don't get me wrong. And she was actually acquitted in 1893 by an all male jury who couldn't conceive of the fact that a woman could do this. Well, you hit on a couple of different things there, what the facts of the case actually were, how we talk about it today, and an all-male jury looking at this woman saying there is no way she could have done it. So what were some of the other little details that came up that were just kind of blowing your mind? Well, yeah. So one of the things that we did, we, we take these um, bodies and in some of the episodes, we autopsy and we do virtual autopsies. We do ballistic tests. With Lizzie Borden, they actually gave me a hatchet, the murder weapon, and I got to see how much force it would take. And crucially, if, uh, if I had committed this crime, how much blood evidence would be on me? Because Lizzie Borden had no blood on her when the police arrived. So one of the key questions we really look at in that show is, if she did it, how did she do it? Um, and there's some really fascinating finds in there. And I, I think people are going to really enjoy going down that rabbit hole. Yeah, I mean, going all the way back to 1892 is not something we do on a normal, <laughs> everyday basis. So I, I think people are going to be all about that. Yeah, I, I go back to 1892 very often, but, but I'm hoping people are going to enjoy that. But we do uh, contemporary episodes as well. So we're doing one on Pablo Escobar, the cocaine king of the 1980s. You know, a lot of people out there know the show uh, Narcos on Netflix, and they might think, what is there to say about Pablo Escobar? Well, we interview his son, who was the last person to speak to him before he was shot by allegedly the Colombian police in Medellin in 1993. But his son is adamant that his father would never have allowed himself to be taken prisoner. And so he believes that Pablo Escobar took that kill shot. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we do is we take these heads out there and on the shooting range and we do a bunch of ballistic tests. We know what kind of guns everybody was carrying on the rooftop in Colombia that day and we're able to come up with a verdict. That's really fascinating because Escobar is somebody that's obviously been talked about, written about for several decades, but looking at him in a new light, I'm sure it's going to pique people's interest. What else can you tell us just about those conversations and really what you learned about Escobar they didn't already know? Yeah, I mean, Escobar, it's, a, it's such a, it was actually really interesting to interview his son. Um, and his son was really very nice about this. He said, look, whatever you guys find out, I'm gonna go with that verdict. Um, but, but Pablo Escobar was actually exhumed several years after he died. And there's video footage of this, it's really bizarre. It was, it was done for a paternity test and they take out the skull and you can definitely see the exit wound there and the kill shot. Um, so all of that was really helpful into piecing this together. But I think that, yeah, I think that's gonna be a really fun episode for people, but we do some more historical episodes. We do Harry Houdini. A lot of people think that he drowned doing a trick in the, in the uh, water torture chamber. Um, but that's a myth that actually came about because a lot of movies were made after he died and they said that he died doing this trick. But one of the interesting things about Houdini is that he was at war with the spiritualists. These were people who said they could commune with the dead. We still have people like that today. And he wanted to expose them as frauds. And the spiritualists had actually predicted that he would die on Halloween 1926. And that's the exact date that he died, which is also, by the way, great death date for Harry Houdini, Halloween. Yeah. Um, so, so we look at all of those aspects. So the show, like I said, it's got the contemporary, it's got the historical, and it's definitely got the curious, mysterious factor. I think you hit on a lot of really interesting things because with Houdini specifically, we try to put him in a box physically, metaphorically, when we talk about him. We only remember certain things about people. Why do you think that is, especially for somebody like you that studies the history so often? 
Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And I, and I think with, with someone like Houdini, was, he, was, he was bigger than life, wasn't he? And one of the things that we bring out in the show is the straitjacket. He really made that trick. If it, it's not actually a trick. We had an escapologist come on and, and uh, it, it escape from this straitjacket. It's more like a skill than a trick. Um, but he made that very famous. And I'm a medical historian, so I deal with the medical past. And straitjackets are really interesting because they come about in the late 18th century. And I tell a little bit of that history and how they were used in those famous sort of lunatic asylums of the period. And they really had this dark history. But here is Houdini, and he's breaking from the chains of his straitjacket. He's an immigrant. There's a very powerful message there in Houdini's act. I think with him, there's certain things that we remember strongly about him because he wanted us to remember that. He was so in control of his brand. You know, today we talk about branding, YouTubers, all this. Houdini was the original brander. And, um, and for him, it's, it's hard to break down those myths because they're so intertwined into that story. Another really interesting thing about your series is you have an episode all about a Titanic victim. And it feels like we're going to be talking about that forevermore because there's so many yeah, fascinating forever. elements to it. What did you yeah. discover and what piqued your interest there? Yeah, the Titanic, you're so right that that is just something. I always remind people that actually the Lusitania sank faster and, and nearly as many people died in Lusitania when it sank. But the Titanic, it's just there's something about that that keeps bringing us back. And one of the things that we try to do in that episode, and especially me as a historian, I like to talk about the side stories, the things that people don't really think about. So when the Titanic sank, most people, that's the end of the story. But actually, there was a morgue ship that went out there and collected all mm -hmm. of these bodies and tried to return them to relatives. And there was an unknown child, a little child who was recovered, and they never identified the child. So this child was buried in an unknown grave in Halifax. And then many, many decades later, the body was exhumed. And I'm, I don't want to give too many spoilers away, but there's a DNA test and there's a, a possibility of an identity at the end. And I think that it's a very touching story. And I hope that besides the main thread, which is about this child, that people will learn something about the Titanic that they didn't know. I'm really interested in that one. And I'm also really interested in your episode on Brittany Murphy and Brian Jones as well, because those are two people that we knew a lot about. They had really tragic early endings. What are the things we don't talk about enough with those two people? Yeah, so Brittany Murphy, for me as a historian, that was the emotionally the hardest episode because I'm used to dealing with the very dead and she died in 2009. And it was a really tragic story. You know, I think she was a victim of her own fame and she was surrounded by people who quite frankly didn't take very good care of her at the end. And um, her the, what makes it so strange is she dies very young under very kind of curious circumstances. And then her husband dies two months later under almost identical circumstances in the same room in the same house. And we actually interviewed his mother, who has some very interesting things to say about Sharon Murphy, uh, uh, Brittany Murphy's mother, who was in attendance at both of those deaths. Um, but I hope that you know people will think that we dealt with it sensitively and will also come at, at, with it a better idea of what had happened. And Brian Jones, that's our most explosive episode. So Brian Jones, for people who don't know of a generation maybe don't know him, he was one of the founding members of the Rolling Stones. He actually came up with the name the Rolling Stones. And allegedly, he drowned in his pool in the 1960s. But I am telling you, everybody who was in attendance at that party changed their testimony. There's even a deathbed confession. And I think there was a real miscarriage of justice. So even if you don't know who Brian Jones is, tune in because it's just one of those episodes. He died at the age of 27. I think he was the first of the 27 Club, if you know mm -hmm. what that is. Um, and, and it's definitely a story worth retelling and you know bringing out the, the truth to light. You mentioning the 27 Club makes me think about something else where we have had a lot of conversations about people dying mysteriously, people dying early. It seems like you were pretty intentional about choosing six episodes about people we may have heard of, stories we may have heard of, but we don't know a lot about. So why was it important to you to choose these people, these circumstances, as opposed to some of the more famous circumstances we've just talked about? Yeah. In I think that's a good question. You know, my mom has been asking me about, she's, she's throwing ideas in for season two. And, but, but the core of it has to be a really good story. I'm a storyteller. I wrote a book in 2017 called The Butchering Art, which is all about Victorian surgery and going into those operating theaters before anesthesia. I like to tell a good story. I like to trans people, transport people back to the past, ideally. So I really love the more historical episodes. But 
it, there has to be a lot of twists and turns. And sometimes, of course, people tragically die young, but there isn't really a mystery there. And I think that that's what keeps these episodes going. Hopefully that's what keeps people tuning in in each episode is that kind of mysterious factor. When you were getting your doctorate at Oxford, what did you plan to do? What were the goals back then? And what's it like seeing all the different things you've been able to do? I like how you, what did you plan to do with the history of science and medicine? I have no practical skills, by the way. Thank goodness something has come of all this. Um, but, you know, I thought at, at first I was going to be an academic, and I realized I really was a storyteller. So I started to go onto Twitter and onto Instagram and all these different platforms, and I began telling stories about people from the past. So one of the things I love about medical history is it's really relatable. If you're one of those people who hated history class, you do know what it's like to be sick. And hopefully in that sense, it's kind of interesting, you know, what would you have done if you had a toothache in 1792 or if you broke your leg in 1843? That's what I try to do. And so I sort of developed this brand and I've been really lucky that people have been interested and wanted to know more and they've propelled me forward. Um, but, but nowadays I'm not an academic. I call myself a storyteller and I just really thrive in that space where I can tell people about why they should be passionate about the past and why it's not, it doesn't have to be a dull story at all. I know you also wrote a book about the history of plastic surgery, and I saw some really gruesome photos, which are probably like an everyday thing for you. They just kind of blew my mind. Yeah. What was it like jumping into that world and just seeing where we were and where we are now with plastic surgery? It's an incredible story. So it's not out yet. I'm just actually finishing it. Um, so it should be out in about 2022. And it's about this guy named Harold Gillies, who's the father of plastic surgery. And he was rebuilding soldiers' faces during the First World War. And what was crazy about this time is the technology had moved forward, but the medicine hadn't quite advanced to catch up with it. And these guys were going out into these trenches, and they didn't realize that they couldn't dodge the, the machine guns. And I always say that World War I was a time when losing your leg made you a hero, but losing your face made you a monster. Mm. And what Harold Gillies does is he gives these men their identity back. And a whole new discipline of plastic surgery is, is, uh, flourishes under Gillies. So I hope when it comes out, people will really like it. It's an epic war story. It's a true story. I have to always say, like, people, you know, I, I do nonfiction. So as crazy as these stories seem, they're all true. Um, including the butchering art about Victorian surgery and all the crazy things we used to do with, before surgeons washed their hands or their instruments um, and before they understood germ theory. Well, we're going to see plenty of great stories on the Smithsonian Channel in the next couple of weeks. Dr. Lindsay Fitaris, really nice to meet you. Thanks so much and best of luck. Thanks everyone. so much. Yeah, thank you for having me.